so Jonathan, tell me when was Adamni uh, founded and, and uh, what was the initial idea behind the, the, the company and your service? Sure, sure. So uh, when I got involved in Adamni, it was 2015. Um, my my, my co-founders had actually come up with the idea in 2009, um, but it was five or six years before you know, they met me and, and we ended up kind of turning it into an actual product and a service. So Adami, you know, is kind of a mashup of advertise omnipresent, so advertise everywhere. Um, and the vision for Adami was to, to make the digital out of home ad networks accessible and purchasable to digital marketers and, and basically help them to drive better outcomes for their brands by tapping into a very powerful channel that up until then really had been manually bought and sold as opposed to automatically bonds. Thank you, thank you. This is great. And so, how do you do? You uh, how is your position different than other programmatic digital out of home buying platform um, available in the marketplace? Sure. So, from day one, we brought a lot of our own backgrounds into the ideas of what a, a, a different user experience is on the buy mm -hmm. side. I come from e-commerce. I spent the first fifteen years of my career. Uh, taking an offline business that was printing and moving it online. And one of our other co-founders um, was the head of software for Zappos.com, the shoe company. Okay. And so for us, it was like, how do we create a really great buying experience, which is easy to access, has transparency on what you're buying and sort of where you're going to be targeting ads and allows you to launch a campaign with liter in literally minutes. Like those are like our three kind of core uh, objectives in the beginning. And so I think that even till today, like we, we take pride in how easy and fast it is to buy through a Domini while also, you know, taking some of that Zappos, you know, ethos about customer service and knowing that for a lot of advertisers, digital home is a new channel for them. And there's like a lack of understanding of how to choose the right screens or use the right audience sets. Um, and so we are there to help them on a managed services basis or to show it to them one time and then let them buy on a self-service basis. Um, and so you roll it all up. And I think that Adami is unique and differentiated from the, the actual experience from the buy side. Um, the other things that we've done over the years to, to provide some uniqueness to, to our offering um, is doing partnerships with supply partners, such as Broadsign, um, where you know, we, we've aggregated a significant quantity of inventory in one platform. Today, we have about 450,000 screens. By the end of the year, it should be north of 600,000 connected screens. And so I think that especially in a world like today where we're living in an amazon.com world, right? People wanna buy as much as they can from as few places as possible. And they wanna do it as easily as possible. And so taking those two things and putting that into a, a product that is available for everyone, whether you're a Fortune 500 ad agency or you know, you're a regional or small agency, it doesn't matter. You know, the idea is that we're breaking down the barriers, making it easy to buy, and also trying to bring some data to prove how it's working. That's been the latest and greatest for us as far as attribution reporting and some of the things we're doing with mobile devices. Thank you, this is great. So what's next then for Adamni? What's, what's the vision? Yeah, so, you know, it's been definitely, um, you know, five years feels like 15 it, it, because there's been so much work and so much kind of groundwork laid. I'd say if, if we look toward the next five years, um, the idea that there's gonna be uh, more digital buyers who look at out of home as part of their, their digital mix, not, traditional or offline, um, I think that that trend will continue to drive up where if today, you know, the last report was about five, 6% of the digital out of home is bought programmatically um, versus 85% that's, that's bought online with you know, the other channels. I see that that 5% continuing to climb toward the 85 as buyers just make this part of their, their mix. Um, today, they just announced Disney's came out with their new ad exchange and they're going to make available all of their connected TV inventory. So Hulu and, 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 you know, these different kind of over the top uh, channels 
with some of their online websites at like ESPN.com. And their goal is to have 50% of their ads sold programmatically, automatically. And so for us, I'd say, that sounds like a pretty good number for out of home. If in the next five years, it goes from 6% to 50%. I think it's both doable and I think it benefits so many different stakeholders who are in the market today, whether you're a media owner or you're an ad agency or a brand. Um, and so, so that's one big trend I would see is just like the use of programmatic growing over the five years. I think, you know, we're in a, in a weird state right now where Data privacy is a big thing, especially with what Apple has put out with what they're about to do with iOS 14 and Google following and cookies. And, um, and I think it's, it's one of those things we're both watching, but also recognizing that it creates opportunities. You know, um, first, mobile has unlocked some really impactful ways for out of home to understand who's driving past the screens, who's walking past the screens. And, you know, today, things like providing the mobile device IDs that were exposed so that audiences can be retargeted, you know, that's a, that's, that's a trend and it's only starting to sort of take off. And we hope that that will continue and not go away with Google and Apple's um, changes. But um, the concept of offline to online and you, you, you prime them on the big screen and you convert them on the little screen or on their laptop is a trend that, that we've bought into and we're hoping that it'll continue. Um, the attribution report. So the idea that audiences were exposed to these billboards, these shopping malls, these, these urban panels, what did they do after they, they saw these ads? Did they go to the store? Did they go to a website? Did they download the app? Um, we've been personally investing a lot into partnerships with companies like Mira who study those things and are able to provide a digital marketer with a sense of, okay, I put this much money in, how much did I get back? Or, or how is this contributing to my overall goals? Um, and so for us, this year was definitely a, you know, making digital at home look and feel and act like the other programmatic channels where there, where there is some accountability to it, um, while also not making it the only thing that we're telling digital marketers because it could go away. You know, there, there could be uh, a loss of mobile device ID, you know, um, access because of what Google and Apple are, are, are talking about doing. Um, and so, like you were saying earlier, the, the contextual relevance still needs to be the primary sort of value proposition, you know, and, and um, but I, I'm really excited about, like, I, I believe, this is just my own personal belief, mm -hmm. I don't believe that it's just going to disappear our ability to like understand audiences traveling past our screens. It might be a little different than the IDFAs and the Google advertiser IDs that the way that they're being accessed today, it might be called something else. Mm -hmm. um, but if we think of a five-year horizon, I, I do believe that the measurability will still be a piece of our offer. Even if it's not every click, every direct response channel type of measure. Right, yeah, that's interesting. and and. Can you tell me more about your your take on contextual while we're talking about this? Like, what what is, um, in your opinion, from what you've observed in the marketplace and the and the requirement or the 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 requests you've received, you know, um, from the industry agencies like, on what are the triggers that can be interesting to to look at uh, for, for a dummy and, and as an industry, you know, what, what are those triggers? Like we, we've long time, like the, the, the famous weather is, is, is one of them, right? Day parting is, is definitely interesting, but there's an infinite number of data triggers that could be accessed and fee, fed into a DSP to, to uh, allow them to bid on specific, um, uh, based on, on those data and inputs and generate much more relevant and contextual uh, experiences for the end user. Uh, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, so I, I think it comes in many flavors. And ultimately, I think the goal for any marketer is trying to find the right place, the right time to reach an audience with the right message. And if you boil all that down, it's just one word, right? Relevance. And 
the way that we optimize relevancy is all situational based, right? You've got a brand who's, who you need to have a conversation with or the ad agency partner of that brand to start with, what are your goals? What is the outcome you're trying to drive? And then how can our platform, these screens that have millions and millions of people that are passing them be used in the most optimal way? Uh, and so some examples of that, which you brought up, you know, a few tactics um, are <clears throat> thinking about the actual venue type. Like we usually, ultimately we say, okay, what are you trying to do? So if you're a sports betting app, like right now we're doing a lot of work with sports betting apps. It's every state is going legal. And so there's a lot of frenzy for people to get new sports bettors, um, you know, to, to start downloading their app and using it. And so I'll just use that as an example. Uh, so if, if, if you're a sports betting app who's trying to drive app downloads and then ultimately deposits, um, you're gonna say, you're gonna, we're gonna ask you, tell us about your, your, your typical customer. Okay, he's male, he watches sports, he likes to go to sports, he has all these kind of qualities to him. And based upon that, we take sort of a, a two-pronged approach. One is, where do you tend to find males who do those kinds of things? And when, are they going to be in the mindset to download an app and do a place a sports bet, right? And so for us, using partnership with Place IQ, Mira, AdSquare, you know, the ability for us to understand geographically where those audiences are, and then also time-based is one big component of that that goes into like our selection of, of the screens and how we design the campaign. The other is the venue types, you know, so. Sports bars, bars and restaurants are a great place to try to reach male sport, you know, sports betters. You're watching the game, you're there for a couple hours and there's a basketball game happening here and then there's get a thousand dollar deposit bonus. You know, it's just that relevancy and that dwell time is such a perfect match for someone to take a, an action. Um, and then there's the convenience stores. You're gonna go pick up your six pack of beer after work. You know, let's hit people between five p.m. And, and 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. with a, a message about sports, you know, or sports betting. And then there's the creative, right? Like the thing that has been most underutilized, I think, with Out of Home is, is the actual message and the content. And honestly, like that's been a limiting factor just because of the way it's been bought and sold in the past. You would have to make an ad, email it to the, the media owners manually. They then schedule it. And then you have to wait to kind of take it down or tell them to take it down or switch it out. And so for us with programmatic, your ability to do tests or to, to do multiple pieces of creative and change it out, um, you know, using the same example of sports betting, it's about to be March Madness in the US, right? Every day there's, there's dozens of basketball games and eventually less and less, but it's literally madness. Like people are just super excited about basketball. And so if you're a sports betting app and you're trying to drive app downloads and people betting on it, why are you every day putting who's playing that day in the, in the markets that they're in? So it's like, I'm in Michigan and I'm, I'm a Michigan Wolverines fan and Michigan's playing whoever, Duke. Like it should, it should say sports betting app logo. And then today, Michigan versus Duke and then, and then the spread or whatever, whatever it is that's relevant. And that's the kind of ability for out of home to deliver a message at scale but with relevancy, that is super powerful. And that'll drive, you know, that lower funnel activity when you do it that way. That's really interesting. Do you find that the marketers or the agency world is receptive to this kind of refinement in their way of planning and delivering their out of home? Or we're still at the early stage of, of that? Or, or is this just an afterthought or something they think of when you, you bring it up to them? You, you see what I mean? Or they're planning it the traditional way still? Yeah. So again, it's situational. I think that there's a major gap in understanding by the digital and programmatic buyers. They, yeah. they, they don't know about Adami and Broadside Reach and programmatic digital home as a channel that can be bought and sold like their mobile and, and their other programmatic digital. Mm -hmm. And so for that group, which is ultimately where we see the biggest up, you know, growth potential, mm -hmm. I think the education, the showing them that this can be done 
having the case studies and, and the, 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 you know, the strategies shown to them is something that over the next, call it 24 months, we as an industry, we as a company, Broadside as a company, need to continue to basically open the curtain yeah. as opposed to like, this is a different stage. You know, the main event is over here. It's like, no, this is here. It's available now. You could do this. Um, and I think that there's going to end up being two sort of flows for that digital programmatic. Mm -hmm. One is we, platforms like ours, which are purely focused on digital out of home with mobile for retargeting, but mostly digital out of home, where you're going to have an experience that's built for digital at home. So your ability to do proximity radius, your ability to do audience targeting and see the different screens um, where, yes, you have Google, you have Facebook, you have Trade Desk, but you also have an Adomni because it provides that, that experience, that, you know, that, that reporting, everything that's perfectly built for digital. And there's going to be some portion of, of advertisers that are just you know, like, I'm good with another channel, another platform, because it creates so much value for me. And I want, I, I really want that, the, you know, that type of a buying process. Then there's the programmatic digital buyers that are saying, I don't want another platform. Like I need another platform. Like I need a whole other, right? Like I want to do all my buying in one place, just like I buy on amazon.com. And so if it's trade desk or DB 360 or Moby, whatever it is, we have to make that available to them there. And even if it's not going to be the exact, you know, channel specific user experience, um, there's going to be an ability for them to do targeting launch campaigns in those platforms. And so to answer your question, I think it is very much early days for the digital buyers that just either don't know about it or it hasn't been reinforced enough through the industry. Um, and then there's the other side of the fence, which is the traditional buyers, the at-home specialists and the brands who have teams that are buying out of home where there's an education process for them too. They're used to guaranteed placements. They're used to you know, a certain RFP process, a certain reporting process. Um, terminology, you know, with, with reach and frequency and TRPs and GRPs that isn't a copy paste to the way that we buy and sell, but, but it is valuable to them too, you know? And, and I think that them being able to evolve their offering to say, there's times when the static billboards and the traditional digital at home needs to be bought guaranteed manually. And then there's this growing need for us to also do these tactics to look and feel like the programmatic digital, because that's what people want. Flexibility, control, you know, day parting, all of these things we talk about. So I think that in both worlds, there is this evolution happening. Um, and we are at still the early days of, of doing that, but, but month after month, more and more buyers are being exposed to this. And once, once you realize what's possible, it's kind of hard to go back or not want to take advantage of, the, of the, these opportunities. So would you then say that um, digital out of home is a brand or a performance marketing channel? So we're about to actually put, push out a, a, an entire marketing campaign around this. And um, you're going to see the term performance branding as part of our sort of way of describing this. My view is that when done correctly, all media is performance media, is performance oriented. There's a mix of formula that will optimize your results. Yeah. And even if some of the channels aren't direct response, where you're putting a dollar in and you're seeing how many dollars you get back within the first day with a direct last click attribution model, if, if you look at performance marketing as that's performance, every single penny is 100% attributable and calculated, then you're, you're going to be missing out on what really is, to me, the, the main goal of outcomes mm -hmm. and a combination of complementary channels where you're exposing them on the digital home screens at a time when they're not watching their program on TV, they're not on their laptop or their phone on Instagram, they're traveling through the world and their mind is open mm -hmm. and you're not you know worried about brand safety issues and you can basically plant seeds in people's minds that by the time later in their day, they're on their computer, they're on their phone mm -hmm. or they're in a convenience store. They're like, what's, what soft drink do I want to buy? What candy bar do I want? You're, you're able to influence those. And, 
And so I, I firmly believe that at a home is a performance catalyst for marketers. And I think that it's incumbent on us, you know, as an industry to recontextualize how people think about uh, performance marketing to focus more on the results as opposed to just these performance reports that you can get the same day that, you know, that, that kind of show that that's a performance channel. So, uh, so yeah, that's my take on a performance branding. Thank you. Um, in the, in the recent Digit Day event, uh, you were presenting and you mentioned four key factors that are driving programmatic digital out of home, uh, even during COVID times. Um, can you tell me more about them? Absolutely. Um, so a, a lot of it is just looking at what's been successful on other sides of the advertising ecosystem and how digital has just continued to climb and you know programmatic has continued to climb and asking yourself like, what is it about programmatic online what is it about what trade desk offers to their their customers um what is it about facebook and google what what how they've been able to amass so much interest and those four things you know firstly it's the ability to go to a website click you know be able to buy and have that accessibility via your fingertips 24 7. Um, I think that's that's number one. You know, the old ways of doing things where ads were sold, where there was a salesperson selling an ad to a buyer has been changed to ads are bought. We're making it possible for you to go and buy and we'll help you along the way if you want to speak to a salesperson, a strategist, but ultimately the accessibility is number one. The targetability. Facebook, especially, right? How much data they have on Facebook and Instagram users and WhatsApp users has enabled them to optimize when and where to show an app. Mm -hmm. And sure, it's one to one and it's great, but it's more about the idea that if that sports betting app wants to reach people, they can show who's been consuming content on Facebook or Instagram or on the web that is sports betting related. And so at a home with mobile technology, has unlocked that also, where whether it's Place IQ or it's Foursquare or AdSquare, any of these companies that are using location data to understand a consumer's kind of histor historical where they've been helps you say, well, this is where I want to advertise because I want to, I want to reach them on screens in those areas. So we now have the targetability. Um, the measurability, you know, up until now, we've been selling on estimated impressions, right? Or spots sold right and the ability to actually show here's the number of mobile device ids that you can retarget here's a, the lift in your particular kpi whether it's football mobile web web conversions um out of home is just not considered a, a measurable performance channel and there there it is like there there is a way for you to layer that into your media mix run it for a month look at your click-through rates, look at your conversion rates, or add on an attribution report and we'll show the exposed audiences what impact they had compared to the control. Um, and so you, know, you, you combine all these different factors in and what it all boils down to is, is it easy and does it work? Like the four factors, three factors, whatever it is, two factors. Is it easy or does it work? <laughs> That's what marketers care about. And up until now, out of home, couldn't really answer that in a very strong way. But the last 18 months that's changed. And, and I think that we can now compete on a level of those other big platforms with the accessibility, the measurability and, and the targetability. On, on that point on attribution and measurability, you mentioned, um, what's the the is there a catch with measurability in a sense that uh, my understanding or, or my take is it it might be tricky at time when you don't have a a sizable campaign to start measuring control versus uh, your your campaign uh, audience the lift factors are not significant so how do you um, how do you address this? How do, are, 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 have you set some threshold that the campaign needs to, to have in order to, to 
to have a, a, a sizable campaign that is significantly uh, measurable, if I can express, express right. it this way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you look at the methodology for how the, the attribution lift report is done, it's taking, you know, historical data of an exposed audience and comparing it to historical data of an unexposed control group. And from there, you're analyzing, did the exposed group take the measured action more than the control group? And that's ultimately what the lift is measuring. Yep. So because this is a statistical exercise, you know, you need a certain sample size to be able to say, I have confidence that it has this percentage of a lift. And so while there isn't a minimum in terms of like, can the study be done? Mm -hmm. The minimum is just making sure that there's statistical significance with enough data points to have that confidence in the result, as opposed yeah. to just a sampling that's small. And so for us today, you know, we tend to say like 10 million impressions gives you that feasibility threshold or above to produce a report. If you have 9 million, does it mean you shouldn't do it? No, like we'll do it, but you just know as a marketer that your confidence threshold might be going down with the less data that you have. Um, ultimately, with out of home, when we say this a lot, you know, it's not the kind of channel that it's just, you know, spin up for a day, you're gonna sell out of your product and then take it down the next day. You need the reach and frequency and that repetition to drive the drive the results. And so that's why, I mean, to, to do, you know, a, a 28 day campaign, which is typically what we see for attribution reports, you wanna be doing that anyways. Like if you want the best results, you know, you wanna have the 10 million impressions. Um, but I will say that the measurement is, has to be kind of positioned correctly where this isn't last click attribution, you put in a dollar, tomorrow you'll see how many dollars you got back. Yeah. This is, you're gonna run a campaign, it's gonna to contribute to all of your objectives across all the different touch points, not just as a standalone. Mm -hmm. And then a week or two after the campaign is over, we're gonna show you the sort of lift you had directly attributable to the out of home. Um, and if your campaign is too small or it's just focused on some areas that just isn't conducive, that's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Like we can still create value for you. Um, but, uh, but ultimately, you know, for us as a company, we've been wanting to prove it, to show it to customers and even say, look, we're going to pay for it. We're going to buy your attribution report. That's how confident we are in you doing that. Um, let's just make sure that, that you set up your, your campaign for success. Thank you. Um, I want to talk scale. You mentioned that, Domni, you, you guys have 450,000-ish screens in the US. Um, can you tell me more about the diversity of your inventory and, and, um, and, and maybe some uniqueness uh, to it? I think one of them is, is fairly um, the Uber partnership, I think, is, is quite interesting to mention. But there's others that I might not be aware or our audience is not aware. Can you, can you tell us more about this? Sure. So the 450,000 is, is actually a global footprint. Um, yeah, apologize. Yeah. yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, but the majority of it is in the U.S. So, so um, I don't know, 80, 80 to ninety percent probably in the U.S. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. So, so since day one, Adami has been, you know, like focused on working with as many supply partners as possible. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's SSPs. In some cases, it's media owner direct. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, our business model is not on the supply side; it's on the buy side. And so, over the last five years. Um, I think right now we've accumulated of 185 unique media owners, publishers, whose inventory is on the platform. Uh, it grows every week um, and it spans about 40 different screen formats, which we can call them venue types as of the last, you know, uh, industry-wide collaboration because it was just crazy. Some of them were called <laughs> call billboards. And so 40 different venue types, uh, every single DMA in the, in the U.S., Mm -hmm. We've got, I think, 18 other countries, um, Canada, Australia, UK in particular, but mm -hmm. also other Western Europe. And, um, and so, you know, we've had campaigns for clients like UFC, who's a global brand, who's selling a pay-per-view fight globally, 
who might launch in the US and Australia and Europe at the same time. Um, and then we all, we've also had small campaigns where they just want to focus in one market and it's a, a sale or something kind of localized. Mm -hmm. um, but it's everything from the super small screens, which is, you know, like, you know, a convenience store screen that's, you know, 15 inches, all the way up to Times Square mega screens, you know, Las Vegas Boulevard, where you have a spectacular by Brandon Cities that's like a football field wide. Um, and everything in between. So many different set sizes, shapes. Um, we, you know, through the partnership, you know, Lamar out, out front, Clear Channel Outdoor um, for the outdoors in the outdoor space, Adams Outdoor. On the indoor, we have, um, you know, Lightbox and Zoom Media and uh, Rouge and, and NRS and, and just dozens more. So think, we like to say it's like wherever you can imagine a high traffic area, whether it's a store, it's a roadway, it's a train station, an airport. Um, we have we have screens that uh, through our partners um, you can access. The, the one new one that is sort of you know unique is is Uber, um, where Uber is you know that is a public company and they're looking for growth opportunities just like everyone else. And they they realize they've got six million cars on the road every day and that's a lot of miles being driven, a lot of kind of exposure for that car is having. Yep. So looking at what some others have done in the past with like taxi tops, whether it's New York City, Chicago, wherever, um, saying, if we can monetize these audiences and create a, a street level advertising network that's complementary to the billboards and urban panels, not a substitute for, um, and if we can, have our drivers make more money by, you know, having a new revenue stream. So they've got Uber rides, mm -hmm. they've got Uber eats, they've got drizzly now for alcohol delivery. And now there's Uber U, which is their advertising network that it, it could be a really great win-win combination for drivers, for advertisers and for Uber um, and Adomni. So we, um, we launched last year in Atlanta, Dallas and Phoenix um, where Adomni's kind of cloud-based software is the sales and, and technology partner exclusively for Uber. Um, and advertisers today can, can go and launch campaigns on the Adomni DSP and target people in those cities. Um, we just announced Los Angeles and Boston, um, which are going live this month. So by April, you should, you'll be able to target those cities. And we've got a, a big announcement that's gonna be coming out in the next week or two um, that also just kind of, it, continues to, to um, grow the importance of that network. So for Adomni, the reason that we said this is really exciting um, and, and this is great for out of home and, and for Adomni is it Uber's a household name. It's a brand that people use sometimes daily, especially in the normal non-COVID world. Mm -hmm. And the ability for, um, you know, for us to do screen sequencing where someone gets picked up by an Uber, there's an ad, and then that ad is driving through the city, exposing cars and, and pedestrians. And then also have that ad shown on an urban panel or on billboards where you're getting that 360 degree kind of penetration for a message um, is just a very powerful communication platform when you combine them. Um, and so, so we're really excited about that partnership and, and what it's, how it's gonna draw attention to out of home is, in general, because this is an out-of-home network. Um, and yeah, and, and so if you, if you combine it all up, um, again, going back to the accessibility, it's, it's being able to reach audiences everywhere in an unmissable way. Mm. So uh, uh, in terms of choice of an SSP for you, like uh, in, in, in the future, I mean, accessibility of screen will, I mean, we're almost there in terms of commoditization of screens it's it's becoming available to most dsp you have an exclusive partnership of course with uh, uber you just mentioned which is great but how do you uh, then um what's important to you in the choice of an ssp sure yeah so um for us we always go back to the customer and what's going to be best for the customer mm -hmm. And when they launch a campaign and they establish their budget, 
that needs to be spent. Like those ads need to be delivered and their desire to return is going to be a combination of, did I spend the budget I wanted to spend and did it work? Right. And so when we, when we look at SSP partners, um, ultimately there's like what inventory is being brought is that scale is, is unique is valuable like number one, but number two is how well built is the SSP so that when we're getting the bid requests and we're responding, are we winning those? Are we clearing? Are we spending the budget? And is that happening in a, in a rapid enough time frame where our algorithms that are deciding what to spend, which is all based on a daily budget, that gets broken down into hourly segments, is are we getting the timely information and is it is it working where we could say, this is a trustworthy, high fidelity SSP partner that we can, we can, we can spend money with and, and, it, and it works. Um, the other side of it is, you know, the quality of the people that you're working with, you know, our dev team is, is got to be lock and step with the dev teams for the SSP. They need to be talking the same language. There needs to be, you know, notifications because both companies are changing and th there needs to be great communication flow when updates are happening so that we can respond and there's not outages or there's not a lack of taking advantage of new features. Uh, and so that's another kind of qualitative uh, me measurement piece is how good are they at communicating? Do, do we feel like we are aligned and we are truly partners? Um, or is it more of like, here's the platform, let us know when you've got, you know, you know revenue and, you know, that kind of thing where there's been some instances, instances where we've run into that where some big companies just don't, don't look at it as a true partnership that they want to invest in and, and have that, that sort of communication flow and open dialogue. Um, and so ultimately, I, you know, I, I think with Broadside Reach, we were one of the first ones and, um, and you were one of the first ones for us too that we kind of plugged into versus just directly integrating with media owners. And it's just been an absolute pleasure from the standpoint of setting the expectations, delivering on what you said, um, you know, having the scale of inventory that has, has been able, enabled us to have companies like Walmart actually place campaigns over those pipes. And then when there's been changes, you know, we're, we're, we're notified and we're working through those together collaboratively. Um, and so it's really the definition of partnership is, has been what Adami and Broadside, I think, have shown over the last few years. Um, and you can't take that for granted because a lot of companies grow and they just make assumptions or they stop caring about the partners. And when, when we're selling something and broadside's making money and the media owner's making money and the advertiser's making money, it's just a beautiful thing along the way that we don't care that it's not a Domni and a Domni as the SSP and the media owner. We don't care. Like mm -hmm. the whole mm -hmm. value chain benefits multiple parties. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's how we can scale bigger and also, you know, all make money together. That's awesome. Thanks for the feedback, and, and I echo that. I mean, um, from what I heard, uh, you, you saying what comes uh, to mind is there's a, there seems over and beyond like what you just mentioned. There's a match in values, I think, between the two companies of wanting to make things done, uh, do the right thing, uh, the right attitude. Right? I think that's that's super important um, in 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 the current context, the business context, uh, which is. We all know it's been a rough year. Um, sh shifting gears here, um, last year was a tough one for our industry, um, uh, but it was a year of consolidation in the sense like media owners became stronger, uh, look at their uh, operation, making them more efficient. Uh, and, and the programmatic um, channel, all the, the, the ecosystem I think is also coming up on top stronger and more resilient than ever. Uh, how do you see the rest of 2021? Nobody has a crystal ball, but uh, where do you see things uh, panning out? Yeah, I, I've said this on a couple of kind of group meetings also that 2020 was the best of times and the worst of times. Mm -hmm. Certainly the, the revenue and, and the, the buy side, you know, did shrink, but that opened up an opportunity for more investment into technology, into partnerships, and um, into data measurability that are things that we needed. Like Adami mm -hmm. needed it, the industry needed it. Um, and so the, the, the smart companies I think did, were the ones that didn't just, you know, retreat, 
and you know, or if they could, some companies had to. But um, for us, you know, it was, an, it was we seized that opportunity. Like we as a company were more productive than ever before with teams that were able to really focus and deliver products at a time when, you know, there wasn't as much demand and constant sort of, you know, servicing clients and, and all that. Um, I, I look at it as a pendulum, right? The pendulum swung all the way to the other side as advertisers were afraid and advertisers rightfully so didn't feel like the channel had the audiences to deliver, you know, a, a meaningful impact. I think that the pendulum swings the op complete opposite end where as human beings, what we've been through is so unnatural. And as human beings, like the ability to go to a bar restaurant and have a beer with friends, to go to a concert, to go get on an airplane and go to on vacation with your family are like fundamental needs that we have as human beings that have not been fulfilled. And that pent up demand, that unnatural artificial you know, closing up is about to wide open. And I would, I predict, and, and this isn't like shocking, but I predict that there's going to be more movement. There's going to be more travel. There's going to be more spending time with friends, being out and about than ever potentially in recorded history, because we need to sort of right the wrong over the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. And so when you think of us as a channel where people pull back, and in that time frame, we now have triple the number of connected programmatic screens and this, these new attribution measurement capabilities and better buying platforms. I think that our ability to seize that opportunity, drive up CPMs for media owners, drive up fill rates and, and yields for, you know, for everyone, and ultimately deliver the, to the advertisers the attention of the consumer who's now in front of these screens more than ever. I think it's going to be a powerful, you know, second half of the year for us that could more than offset what we went through. If you think of it over not maybe a few month period, but over like a one to two month period, two year period. Um, and so we're excited, we're ready. We're excited, there's, there's more, there's definitely more work to be done, um, but we're really starting to see a lot of RFP activity. And you know, it's, it's one of those things that when New York is open and LA is open, um, it's, we'll be right, we'll be, we'll be waiting and um, I think that a lot of companies who weathered the storm well and, and invested into it, like us, um, are going to benefit. Totally agree on that. That uh, well put. Uh, I like your. I like that. Thank you. Um, is there? Uh, we we talked about um, last week's announcements from Google. Um, I know I'm I'm shifting back. You answered the um, into uh, an earlier question um, about context and everything. But do you see this as being a catalyst for the industry as a whole, uh, or is because the announcement is, it is is a bit different than everyone was expecting in some in some ways? Um, privacy is at the center of everything now, uh, advertising wise. Consumers are more um, aware of it, uh, more uh, focus on, on that as well. Uh, everyone in the ad, ad tech industry uh, are are being uh, need need to be creative and finding ways of achieving the same thing uh, before, but in a in a in a more uh, contextual way or a more creative way. Um, do you have anything to add on your answer from earlier? You know, it, it's one of those things that um, it's a very fluid marketplace, and um, and it's. It's on us and our kind of data team, our partnerships team to read every piece of information that comes out, measure everything, every change that's made and be able to internalize that and then kind of share that with our customers and revise our, our products around that. Um, you know, for every action, there's a reaction, right? The, the, the old physics thing. And so Apple basically, you know, taking a stand where they're not an advertising company, you know, they're, they're just not. And they're a services company more and more and they, they, they realize how much money is being made through some of these services, through advertising that they're not privy to, even though they charge Google an insane amount of money every year to be the default search engine for, for Safari. So I think that that sort of domino where Apple made a, made, you know, made a, took a stance as a marketing ploy, it's not really benefiting them aside from just like people percept, perceiving that their, their products are more privacy compliant. And then Google, with Android being slightly more as far as market share saying, okay, well, we're going to respond and we're going to also 
sort of set in certain things, whether it's on mobile or it's the cookie kind of going away for Chrome. Um, you know, if you're a digital marketer, attribution has been a challenging thing always. Like multi-touch attribution has always been one of those sort of like, you know, 50%, you know, 50% of what, what you think is going on isn't really happening. And I forgot what that, the, the phrase is there, but, um, and, and so this only hurts, I think, a programmatic and digital buyer who is looking at reports and trying to make intelligent decisions off of that. Um, I, I think it, it hurts them in, the, in their ability to, to do some of that. But I also think that Google and Facebook are walled gardens and they are sitting on the, their own data where, you know, they're not gonna be as affected, maybe Facebook through its audience network and some of these things that, that it's doing where it was getting data from other sources, that's gonna be affected, but it's core business. Google search, Facebook and Instagram ads on their platform are not affected. They're, they know what you're doing, where, where, what you're searching for, all of that. For us in out of home, I think that, and what I've always said is, I, you know, we need to trust the experts that are out in the market. And so right now that's Place IQ, Mira, AdSquare, the guys who their whole livelihood survives on this data being available to them. And what I'm hearing from them, like as recently as the last couple of weeks is iOS 13, when that came out, that was supposed to be the crushing kind of release. And we saw like a 10 to 15% re reduction in observations. We still have billions that we were seeing. That consumers are still opting in. And especially if apps start to use their voice to say, hey, your experience with our app is going to be significantly degraded if you don't opt into this. Where most consumers, especially young ones, millennials, are just like, it's fine, you can have my data. I'm going to just allow. Where right now, they're not as concerned that this is like an apocalypse for location data when IDFA or Google advertising ID goes away. Um, time will tell. Like, we need it probably a month after it, the release happens and then people start actually choosing whether they're going to opt in or opt out before we're going to know. Mm -hmm. But right now, there isn't this severe concern from the, the people whose whole livelihood relies on that which we're going to take cues from, right? They're, they're going to be way smarter than we are. Much more, much more revenue that's impacted as a result of that. Um, I do also believe that, and this has gone through software since its existence, every action is a reaction. So it might not be called IDFA, it might not be called Google Advertising ID, it might not be called Cookie, but something will emerge as a new format that allows marketers to understand relevance. Because to sacrifice relevancy purely for privacy mm -hmm. is a destructive exercise. And there are ways with the right people in the right rooms to come up with solutions like Google's whole thing is flock right now where they're going to aggregate, you know, this, this data and still be able to say like in groups, this is how you can target these audiences and where like, they're not going to cut off their nose just to, just to, to fight off Apple, like, you know, and so I, I personally, like Jonathan and I, theory is that it will be this constant. It's like you've got hackers and you've got the spy, anti-spyware. Like you're going to constantly have these, these opposing forces. And it's on us to just make sure that we're nimble enough to roll with the punches, evolve with what the newest thing is, and maintain the core message of it's going to drive results. And whether you're getting it through this mechanism or you're just going to see it through another way, we have the physical world, we have your mm -hmm. attention, mm -hmm. and that is not changing whether it's a cookie, an IDFA, or, or, or a Google advertising server. Thank you for the answer, this is great. And it pushes us, I think, as marketers to, uh, to do good marketing. It sounds simple, but it, it does uh, bring us back to the root of marketing, like you mentioned earlier, uh, pushing the right mess, not pushing, creating the right message um, and, and making it as relevant as possible in the right place at the right time. So this is, this is great. I appreciate exactly. that. Exactly. So we're on top of the hour. I think we covered everything. I, I wish this would go, go on for another hour. I really appreciate your time, uh, Jonathan. This, this is amazing, really amazing value. We'll, we'll, um, we'll turn this into, like I mentioned, into a blog post. Um, uh, do, do you want to uh, do you want to see it prior to publishing it? Do you want to take a look at it? Sure. Yeah, Luba, Luba and I would love to take a take a take a look at the draft. Perfect. Excellent. I'll share with you. 
I appreciate uh, everything. Is there anything else you wanted to add or wanted no, to share? No, no, just um, that hopefully I can see you in Vegas sometime soon. And I would love that. Yes. Yeah. It, please let me know when you're coming to town next. And, um, and otherwise, let's just coordinate our marketing teams that when we have some of these great big campaigns that we can echo, you know, because a big thing for us right now is case studies and letting people know that if you're in this vertical, this is what you can do with the platform. Mm -hmm. So, you know, staying in touch with Luba and making sure you're, you guys are aligned and then we push it out and you guys can also push it out too. Yeah, Perfect. That'd be awesome. Happy to, to, happy to participate and in, in, uh, collaborate on this for sure. Great. Awesome. Christian, pleasure.